grew up in a place called the camp. And all Filipino and Mexican families lived there and they all worked in the canneries. My mom and dad had uh, seven children. And I don't know how we made it. <laughs> I don't know how we made it, you know. But um, uh, I know that sometimes at the end of the week we'd run out of food, you know, and um, it was like lettuce and tomato sandwiches, <laughs> you know. And, uh, but then the next week would come and, and you know, you had, you had meat on the table again. Gene Banday is a retired member of the International Longshoremen and Warehouse Union, the ILWU. Gene spent over 35 years working on the docks and was followed into the industry by many of his family members. I struggled seven years as a casual. I had a full-time job and pregnant twice, and to struggle seven years and get your letter, like, wow. I never thought I would own a home. And still now, I sit in my home, and you're like, wow, you own a home, and wow. Entry-level dock workers are called casuals. As jobs become available, casuals can choose to work and accumulate hours. When the need for more full-time workers arrives, casuals with the most hours receive a letter notifying them of their change in status to full-time. This process can sometimes take over 10 years. Oh, yeah, the day that my dad got his letter to, to come in, it was something I could never forget because I also been waiting for a long time. You know, all, all my brothers were waiting for my dad to have his, have his day. And he worked almost 60 years of his life. He never gave up. No matter what came at him through the family, through the hardships, he never gave up, never wavered, never complained, never cried. And that's why that one day came when he was able to finally get in. All the financial hardships that he had, they were gone, just like that. I'm so proud of the individuals that say, this is my shot. I'm going to make sure I do the union proud. I'm going to do a good job for the employer. And then I'm going to reach back and pass along what it feels like to have this work ethic and do this great job to the person behind me. It's pretty contagious and pretty awesome. It really is a question of when you give a worker the opportunity to become sort of like middle class or whatever we call it, so much comes with that. The medical care, the education, the ability for your kids to do better than you did. Uh, and, and, and that's what it's all about. We're like the pinnacle and we're living the American dream, you know, and we need to preserve it. We need to preserve it. We need to spread it around more because it's the gap's getting wider. They don't want a middle class anymore. We're the last of the Mohicans. So, you know, we got to we got to buckle down and be ready for whatever comes, no matter what. Ronnie's uncle, Gene Banday, spent a lifetime in the LW as a volunteer and an officer. During his career, Gene brought members of the union together to protect the rights on the job. Everybody just basically told him, hey, Gene, you can do this. Can you do this for us? And he always answered the call because he knew, well, I'm not going to leave it to some chance. If I know that my, my brothers just around me are saying I have the skill level to do this, let me step in and handle it for them. I always wanted to be very helpful in the union, okay? Uh, a lot of it came about through sports, you know. Um, there were, there were uh, softball teams and slow pitch teams that would get together and play every, every bloody Thursday. You know, they'd have tournaments and then there was a league. So I was on a, a team called um, the Wild Bunch. Dave Arian came to me one time and said, let's take the Wild Bunch to Hawaii. The Wild Bunch went to Hawaii to participate in an ILWU softball tournament, which included teams from the local 142, the ILWU Hawaii local that included workers from longshore, warehouse, agriculture, hotels, and general trades. So I put that together, got it all together, and, and that kind of put me in a leadership role. About 1989 is when I ran for office. I ran for secretary treasurer. Democracy is not only about people running or people voting, but there's a participatory part of democracy where you're involved in the fabric and the structure of institutions. And when you look at sports, a lot of guys will get involved in sports, they won't show up to a meeting, but they'll get involved in sports and there you can have the opportunity to pass on the things that are important to the union. You gotta understand that when you run for office, you usually have like a, a committee Okay, well, my committee was my team, you know. They put out the word and it went out to other teams 
And yeah, Gene's an okay guy. Word kind of got around, and next thing you know, um, I ran for secretary treasurer and won. You know, I come from a family, mother and father, who met here in the canneries, okay? Uh, he was Filipino descent, she was uh, Mexican descent, and they met there, and the two cultures kind of had to blend, right? And they were giving cultures. They took care of one another. And um, wasn't really close to the church at all, but my wife, who's African-American, her father was the minister of a congregational church in Los Angeles, okay? So she grew up as a pastor's child. And um, the two of us kind of blended, you know? I, I really admired her for her spirituality. And I, one of my most, the most things that attracted me to her was her spirituality. Four to six years after our, our marriage, um, I got selected to become an, to come into the ILWU. You know, it's a different life. <laughs> Union life and working on the waterfront and Christian life, but trying to make the blend, trying to make the blend, trying to uh, take care of people and, 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 you know, look out for one another on the job, which is kind of what the ILWU is all about. That was like his big thing. The safety was just huge for him. He wanted to see people go home at the end of the day. That was what was most important. The ability to pass on how to be a, a good longshoreman for many of us came from our fathers who were in the industry and, and there was always a story that if you messed up on the waterfront by the time you got home that night, your dad was waiting for you. Most of this came from the idea that they wanted you to work safe. And if you were willing to show that you were willing to work, they were willing to teach you. We put our lives on the line every day. There's a lot of nasty stuff out there flying around. And the sacrifices that were made before us, we could never forget. So when I go, I give 110. So that way, if I'm not on my game that day, at least you're getting 100. See? And that's how I look at it. And we try to promote that. We all eat off not the same table, the same plate. Growing up, watching my dad get up, oh, dark 30, you know, way before the sun comes up, I think it does something to you, to the core of you. And he and so many others that work out on the waterfront, what they do for their children by having that commitment to work. And basically imparting a value system that can reach back and have a legacy for generations. At the end of the day, we're just working stiff like anybody else. We just happen to be organized. We just happen to have that backbone that was put in place a long time ago. Now we just have to carry it from the heart now and be willing to go that extra mile. If, if, if need be, I'll lay my life on the line right here. I got no problem because I'm not going anywhere else. This is all I got. I am a longshoreman, I am ILWU, see? But it's for you, it's for the next guy. I wanna make sure that he could do what I would've been able to do with my brothers and my dad and my uncles. I want it to be passed to generations. I don't want it to just go, well, this is the last vestige. No, it's not gonna be. I think the ILWU values come from the experience of the ILWU. You couldn't have been any lower in society, you know, in the 30s and for the 30s, the longshoremen. So each generation that has come along you know, and advance themselves, they're, they're, they're still tied into a history of knowing what it's like to be down and out. During the time that I was in office, uh, you know, uh, myself and the president, Rene Herrera, uh, we would have to drive to meetings and he would pull up to, on the freeway. There would be somebody who was asking for money and he'd stop and he'd pull out a wallet and he'd say, uh, gotta pay our toll. And he'd pull out a couple bucks, give it to the person and we'd be off on our way. Growing up, whenever my dad would see a homeless person, he would always give them some cash. And it, was, it wasn't just like a buck and a half. Like he'd some kind of, sometimes take like 20 out of his wallet and give it to someone. The other thing that he did that was really interesting is whenever he gave someone money, it was like he already knew them. You know, my dad is that kind of person. It's like everyone that he meets has value and everyone that he meets is close to him. You know, they, for some reason, feel like that love, that attachment, because he's so open and so loving. So some people kind of want to give ho homeless individuals money kind of like this because they don't want to touch your hand. And, you know, he would shake their hand, give them, give them a leg up, and then, you know, also a little bit of advice, hey, hang in there, you're going to be all right. And so dad was just always on a different level when it came to those kind of interventions. And so 
that greatly affected me. And later on, as a Los Angeles police officer and, and then a sergeant and a, a patrol supervisor, it just made a huge impact on the way I saw the community and the way I tried to outreach to the community. Although Nikki is Jean's niece, she refers to him as her father because he raised her from a young age after her father, Randy Evans, passed away. And so Nikki must have been about four or five years old. And, uh, and so, you know, we took her everywhere. I took her everywhere. You know, I was a father figure in the house for her. So she calls me her earth dad. And uh, Randy, of course, is her spiritual dad. When her dad passed, I think she was really looking for a father figure. She had her mom, but um, yeah, there was no one really there to fulfill that role. And I remember even my dad, you know, kind of telling her like, I, I can never replace your dad, but I'll always be here to protect you if you ever need someone, you know. He just opened himself up to her. Anytime she needed something, he was always there. Because of that, they're as close as father and daughter can be. He just kind of adopted me, took me under his wing, and I remember there was this jacket and it was a, it had the Longshoreman's Warehouse Union logo on it, and I wanted this jacket so badly. And so, just to kind of make me feel more a part of things, he went and had had it embroidered with Daddy's Girl on the back. And uh, I, I rocked that jacket all through high school. I mean, like, I'll throw it on every now and then when I miss my dad. Something about that sense of family, and he wanted to extend that to me, and so it's, it was, uh, you know, it's almost like a symbol of, of embrace from, from the union. My family always uh, associates itself with the term village. We all take care of each other, and we're all very um, active in each other's lives. And my children are not just my children, they're my mom's children, and they're my aunt's children, my brother's children, you know. It's, it's that concept that um, we're all part of each other and we all belong to each other. I think my kids are great kids. A lot of the things that they have seen me do with the union, my service to the union, them coming to meetings with me, you know, they got kind of a, a look at what, what it's all about. The giving, the taking care of people, um, uh, always looking out for the other guys, you know. The family really is the foundation of allowing the next generation and the generation after that to do better and move on and preserve what's positive in our society. And so unions lay the conditions for families being able to advance the next generation and the generation after that. We've all been able to have a part of that American dream. You know, everyone goes out and looks for a house. We're able to drive a decent car. The most important is giving our kids that opportunity to have that education that we didn't have. Education's big for us, you know. Um, I have the concept that um, Knowledge is everything. Knowledge is power. Being a mother now, I kind of understand how much it means to be able to afford the proper education, a good education. I went to all private schools. I went to like probably one of the best high schools in LA. I went to Loyola and just because of that, it changed how I, you know, how I thought about my lot in life. You know, it, it really became like, what can you make of yourself with the opportunity? They're shooting for the moon now where before we were just like, we're just trying to get a paycheck. It's totally different, see, and we want that. There's professionals in my family now of that generation that have gone on to get degrees and they're utilizing them. We salute members of the International Longshoremen and Warehousemen Union. who refused to unload a South African cargo ship. In response to this demonstration, other workers, church people, community activists, and educators gathered each day at the docks to express their solidarity with the dock workers. Nelson Mandela was uh, in jail for 25 years and he had just got released from prison. And uh, he comes to Los Angeles and he's at the Coliseum. And the Coliseum holds, what, 90,000 people? Packed. 
And during, the, during his speech, you know, he thanked the crowd he, and he thanked everybody in general about, you know, their support and stuff. And uh, then he took a sec and he said, I want to thank Harry Bridges and the ILW for stopping ships on my behalf and in support of fighting apartheid. The crowd went wild. The crowd went wild. It was amazing. I don't even know that they knew who the ILW was, but it just took them. And like I said, my chest went out, you know. We had a big sense of pride in my family about that. Um, I think, you know, if you don't stand for something, you fall for everything. And the, the people in the union have those kinds of principles, and they, they stand up for what's right. And um, so it was something that really does make its mark on me. I get chills just thinking about it. When we saw what was happening in South Africa, are you kidding? What we had to go through here, what our four brothers had to go through before, they're not going to sit there and stand for that. You guys want to have trade with them, but then you want us to handle that cargo? We're not going to do it. We're not going to do it. We're not hypocrites. The money's not that important. You understand? We'll go to the bread and wire diet if we have to, just to prove a point. See, we're not going to be part of that. We're going to go with the average Joe, the working stiff. We're going to go with the people. Harry used to say that uh, war and politics is too important for, or, to be controlled by the politicians. And so Harry would say that it's the obligation of the union to take very clear stands on issues that are important. And when it came to the question of Mandela, it was just logical for the union to take a stand in his defense as they had in many others around the world. We have to, in this world, in this country especially, you know, we really need to learn that the people to our left and the people to our right were our brother's keeper. Our involvement in that and our stance in that proved that. And you know, when you don't have a self-interest and it's really just because you want that for someone else in the world, it's unbeatable. An injury to one is an injury to all. It lines up with everything. An injury to one is an injury to all is an ILW slogan that represents the idea that the strength of the union lies in its unity and that the well-being of each member will be supported by staying committed to this ideal. This is especially true with demanding good health benefits for all the members and their families. When we go into contract negotiations, and this goes back to the 50s, the first number one issue that we negotiate is the health and welfare benefits. Not wages, not pensions, not health and safety, nothing else. And until we get our package, we don't negotiate anything else. I've been able to raise seven kids. And I have my, my youngest one, he's autistic, nonverbal, and he has cerebral palsy. So he basically is going to stay with me till the day I take my last breath. But the union has set me up with my son to have medical care for the rest of his life covered underneath my plan, our pension plan. I just got the letter recently to say that. He's good to go. A ton of bricks lifted off my shoulder. Because he's gonna need care. See, he can't talk like me and you. But, but he knows what's happening. He's able to communicate. But he's taken care of for the rest of his days, even when I'm gone, thanks to the IWU. My experience with the union has been a growing experience. It's been a growing experience for my family. Uh, and it's allowed us to provide for our family and uh, just experience the things that we've been able to experience, you know. And I'm very proud to be a, a member of the ILW.